Hello and welcome to Pitch Boxing. We have got an exciting episode ahead of us here and I am delighted to be joined in the Algarve where we are going to do a little bit of warm weather training later. But before we do that, delighted to be joined by Gareth A. Davies and the amazing fan, Jake, who is going to talk us through uh, what it's like to be a boxing fan in today's day and age. So I'm going to kick off by saying, because it's quite strange, the Wilder Fury way off or just the bizarrest of standoffs, wasn't it? Gareth, you've been to enough of these. What do you make of them? Well, Wilder taking a vow of silence was a surprise to everyone because in the lead up to this, since the rule, the arbitration ruling where he got the right to a trilogy fight with, with Tyson Fury, he'd been accusing him of being a drugs cheat. He made lots of allegations about the gloves, how his water was doctored. So when it actually came to the press conference itself where he made a statement about bloodshed and knocking a head off and then sat down and put his headphones on. That vow of silence spoke volumes. The, the silence was deafening, wasn't it? Um, weirdly, I had spoken to him beforehand with the British media and we'd got a dressing down from his co-manager, Shelley Finkel, because we hadn't put his side of the story during these months of talks between Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury for that giant fight to be made in August, which is obviously now collapsed. But um, Wilder is a man deeply aggrieved he doesn't want to give any mental ground to Tyson Fury at the moment. And he used the simplest way to block Fury out, which was not engaging with him. And, but he was very weird with the British media as well. I think it worked. Like, it's, it's the quietest I've ever seen Tyson Fury in years. And I think there is no point trying to go tit for tat with him at a press conference because he is the king of it. He, he did it to Klitschko. He's done it to countless opponents who maybe not at that top level and he's always comes out on top so I think Wilder actually I think he played played it perfectly I think it's he silenced Tyson Fury five minutes 40 though is a long time I can only imagine psychologically standing there for five minutes 40 in front of him is silent and keeping silent but also having someone silent in front of you for that length of time must be now strange is, is that fight one already psychologically is well look Tyson Fury got up in the in December 2018 in Los Angeles he got up from Wilder's biggest punches he was knocked down twice and he fought back in that 12th round he got up like the undertaker didn't he he rose like a phoenix from the ashes and he 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 took it to Wilder and then in the second fight in February last year he really took it to him he, he beat him he knocked beat six bells up. out of him yeah. he beat him up I think when you're fighting someone you know having watched boxing a very long time and been around it a long time once once Fury hits him again in the third fight I think Wilder will return to type. I do agree with you to a certain extent, Jake, amazing fan that you are. Um, I'm just Gareth A. Davis and he's an amazing fan. But <laughs> well, he you're the amazing, amazing no, you're no, the no. American, yeah, I was gonna say, no, oh, no, you, don't, you don't need an introduction, everyone knows you're a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you know I've got an ego the size of a small planet well, I anyway. But, but I do but, now. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, I think it's a very good point you made. Because um, I hadn't thought of this before now, is in that standoff, Tyson Fury was playing with him in Los Angeles in the past, playing with him in Las Vegas, and he let Wilder have his distance. I think it will all change in fight week. I'm looking forward to being there because that's when we're really going to be able to tell. Yeah, and for me, I think that Wilder can't be as bad in this fight as he, as he was in the last one. I think that fighting Ortiz and Brazil in the lead up to that fight was the worst possible thing that he could have done. Two people who were just there to be hit. And as much as Ortiz won six rounds, he never really troubled Wilder. No, he that. was in trouble for a round and a half. And then, and then Wilder landed the uppercut. No, I was there in New yeah. York. He was in trouble for a round, but he, he worked his way through it. That's what he really he did. He didn't ever have to... Like, he never won one round in that fight. He doesn't Wilder. need to because he's got the right hand, but he, doesn't he? He, need, he needs to try and do something against yeah. Fury to not let... Because Fury's so clever, that double feint. You need to do something. You can't just rely... On you know Ortiz and Brazil, big blokes, quite old, not the best movers, so he can rely on that right hand. But Fury, the way he moves, you can't rely on just one punch because the chances of you landing it. Like he got so lucky to land it twice in the first fight, 
And he yeah, thought, but Fury was defensive it. in that fight. Yeah. So the thing is with Wilder, he's a come forward fighter. Mm -hmm. He's a bully. So you put the bully, any bully, you put them on the back foot, they can't bully you. And that's what happened in the second fight. Fury went at him straight away. Wilder was never allowed to come forward. So he was never able to do what he does, which is he inches forward. And he's looking to get in range with the right hand and the left hook. And he has got a very good jab. That's what I'm fascinated to see this time. Really whether, he can, it, yeah. whether he can actually go in a battle of the jab against Fury. It's, what's fascinating in this third fight is what policy Wilder's going to take and what policy Fury's going to take. It's going to be fascinating. What do you make of the Malik King Scott like a, as his new trainer? Do you think that he'll be, be able to turn, like, from a fan's perspective, from my perspective, it's like I've always felt that he's just so stuck in his way. But will this new coach be able to, to change that completely and get him using that jab and get him to try and box a little bit against Fury? We're seeing that on the social media clips, that he's moving more, he's changing levels. Um, he's actually using footwork rather than just inching forward. And as I say, he's got a good jab. What he needs to do, if I was working with Wilder and what Malik Scott knows the nuts and bolts of the sport, he's been around the world for 25 years. He didn't get to the top level himself, but he really knows the industry. I knew him, his whole body's covered in tattoos, and I knew him before he had a single tattoo, and he used to be a tall, skinny thing. He's a brilliant guy. He's a great motivator for Wilder for this fight. That's what he is. But if Wilder can establish some forward movement in this fight, then... I think it's going to be a really good contest. I don't know if you're looking forward to a trilogy fight or whether you're disappointed that there wasn't a Fury uh, um, Joshua fight. I'm, I'm slightly disappointed, but before we come on to that, we're going to kick out to Rich Anthony and Tasha to see what they think about that back in the UK. So we were finally announced last week and it was the big, the big face-off, if you want to call it that, Fury versus Wilder 3. And what did, what did you make of Presser? <laughs> It was, uh, yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. I nearly fell asleep. It was, uh, listen, Tyson's always entertaining. Uh, not just like the outfits, the suit choice. I think anything he says, he'll, he'll sell a fight. Brilliant. But I just thought, I've said it a few times. I think Deontay Wilder mentally is what I worry about. Um, I think for him to be as vocal as what he has been and to come out with some of the excuses he has done since the first fight and then not say anything. I mean, you have a, I think you sort of, I don't know, contractual, like you're meant to try and sell a fight. And I don't mean, I know a lot of fake, fake beef goes on, but uh, to not say nothing and then. It's beef. Did you actually well, just say fake beef? Fake beef. Just <laughs> it happens, mate. Fake beef happens. I'm not about Mexican beef or anything like that. I'm talking fake beef, oh. mate. It's, um, no, but listen, I think just bizarre. And then the old five minute, the old five minute stare down, I just, I just thought it was all really bizarre. I don't think there's loads you can say out about it other than a bit of a circus. And there's very few people that want to see this third fight. And I don't think that press conference would have changed or enticed many more fans to want to see the third fight. I think, I supposedly Wilder said he weren't going to engage with press or do much with press because he feels so badly disrespectful. Sorry, so badly disrespected. Respected. Yeah. Easy for me to say. So badly disrespected. <laughs> after what happened after the last fight. Uh, so he, he kind of switched off from it. But like you said, Tasha, how do you sell a fight if you turn up and refuse to speak? It's it's not easy, is it? Well, I, I got, I, like I said, it was just a bit bizarre. I was a bit confused by what he was doing. At first, I thought it was like, remember when Groves did it to Frock and just sat there with his headphones on and like it was like something that he'd learned as like part of a psychological game that he was playing. So at first, I thought it was that. And then... And they just stood there looking at each other for five minutes and no one would say something. And so I just got a bit confused about what it actually was. So I didn't really get it. No, it were, it were just, you know, just not to, it was just bizarre, weren't it? You know, even watching it and, you know, because of everything that's happened with AJ and Fury and it's yeah. not happening. Watch that, you just start to think, don't you? This whole thing's becoming like, this yeah. is all just becoming a farce, isn't it? We're, after, nobody's after, after the AJ fight falling through, you're gonna think. I actually thought oh, we might we might see something a bit balmy at this press conference to try and get people talking about it. I mean, we did see some balmy, but I think not in the kind of way of oh, I want to see this fight. Well, look, one thing for sure, Tash, it can only get more interesting, can't it? After that, it can only go up. We're hoping so. We're hoping so. <laughs> I mean, the worst thing that could happen is Fury gets beat. Um, yeah, yeah. But the 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 Joshua and Fjord thing in Tatters, but it's probably a given that one of them is. 
Thanks, guys. That's great. So we touched on the fight that was postponed. It's called off. It's cancelled. Long time. Gutted not to see the fight. Or you know, like as a fan in, of this sport, you kind of you get to a stage where you just stop believing that anything great's going to happen. But I, even I got sucked into this one that you know it was going to get signed. Eddie was promising us all that it's a week away, it's a week away, it's a week away. It never happened. And then you just look and you just go, boxing. Yeah. It's, just, it's never going to change, is it? And for you, AJ Fury, I mean, you spent so long on it, didn't you? How, how, what did it feel like when it was ripped away from you? Well, well, when you've got a big negotiation going on and you're covering the narrative of the story, you spend more time speaking to people behind the scenes than you do actually putting stuff out there. Um, I think that was the biggest disappointment, talking to, certainly I've never covered an event, I go right back to Mike Tyson fights and all the Floyd Mayweather fights, the Manny Pacquiao fights, you know, Calzaghe in Vegas, Nassim Hamid, all these guys, massive fights, never known anything take so long to sign and there, there, there was this weird feeling that things weren't right and when you're ringing seven people every two days to see, get, see where the story's going, no, it was, it was, it was, it was a relief in one sense but it was exasperation in another the biggest greatest richest most dramatic far-reaching fight we've ever seen which i think should have been in the uk not saudi arabia by the way so there may be benefits from this in the end um but this happens in boxing so many egos so many broadcasters you know the, the, everyone wanting their slice of the pie and it can go awfully wrong because they they fall out with each other the thing, the thing that annoyed me more than anything is fury having the cheek to come on announce the fight and then a day later i know you could say the arbitration but there's no way somebody he or his team didn't know about it so i don't know about the, the cheek gonna because happen. you know you might say eddie hearn had the cheek to announce it 10 times when it wasn't signed you know um, I think so the one thing we can learn from this is there's no rules in boxing, is there? It's well, the world west, we've said it before. Thanks yeah. ever so much, we'll be back. Hello and welcome back. And the world of boxing has changed dramatically over the last couple of weeks. You know, deals going left, right and centre. Gareth, give us an overview for, uh, for all the listeners out there. Well, I think it's um, been heralded through the kind of lockdown of the pandemic for a start because everyone's shifted the way they're doing things. And I think, I think linear is becoming linear television is becoming more of an outsider and digital TV, digital platforms now are becoming so powerful. Um, poorly kept secret that Eddie Hearn and Matchroom were going to go with the zone. We know that they were building something when they offered him a billion dollars in an eight year deal for Matchroom USA in America to try and take over the American market. No surprise that three years later, a nine figure deal, five year deal to go global, meaning all the UK and Ireland stuff as well. He moves away, leaves Sky open. They moved quickly. They've signed Bob Arum and Top Rank. And I think Top Rank will produce some cards in the UK around people like Josh, Josh Taylor. But obviously all their other stars, Teofimo Lopez, Vasil Lomachenko, Shaka Stevenson, all these kind of guys that we'll see through the night. Um, what I'm fascinated to, to see is how Sky work with Boxer, this new, um, it was a tournament style event, wasn't it? By this young promoter, Ben Shalom. It's how Sky deal with that. And then outside that, which I think is fascinating as well, this YouTuber um, infection into the sport. I, I mean, infection in a, in a in a negative way. But they've come into the sport. They're very powerful. The the Paul brothers, um, Triller, um, now KSI signing a deal with Wasserman Boxing, who the Sourlands had obviously created a deal with. That's the spectrum at the moment. And for me, the paradigm has shifted this year. It's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? And Jake, before I come to you as a fan, we're going to throw out to Rich and uh, Tasha and Crawler. Tasha's actually got a deal. Um, she's going to be fighting in August under the new Matchroom Design deal. So uh, let's hear what she thinks. So, Tasha, big news this week, and you were one of the first ones to do it. Game changed. In fact, I should say, I'm hashtag game changed. Tasha, you've signed with uh, Design. What do you think? Where did that, are you excited? What do you think he does to boxing? Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think we live in a new age, um, especially with the young audiences coming through. We've seen, you know, the likes of the, some of the YouTube stars cross over, and it, it, it is a new time for boxing, um, because we're we're trying to engage a different type of audience, and we're not going down the traditional routes of, you know, on terrestrial TV or on on Sky Television. So, um, you know, that that's that's all I can say. Really, <laughs> there isn't much to say. I think it's. There's, yeah, there isn't much to say. 
I, and what I is- think you. I think, listen, it, it was always coming. I think we've said it before, it's probably the worst kept secret, wasn't it? But I think, like Tash said, I think it's sort of the time we're living now. I remember years ago, some um, influencer saying to me, like, TVs, they're almost, other than sort of live live sport, but well, this is suggests different, they're going to become like radios. You know, you look now, you go into a room, Rich, I guess now the missus and the kids, how many people are actually sat there watching TV? They're not on a tablet. They're not on a phone. They're not watching something online. Um, and that's how that's how I think the world is going. But obviously, there's no denying it is at the minute. There's, for instance, sort of Sky Television or Terrestrial Television would have a much bigger audience than a streaming service. But I think only time will tell. Only time will tell. I know they're, they're through like enormous money behind it. Um, I know Eddie, the matching team, they're signing a lot of fighters. Um, but I think I think like anything, only time will tell. Um for the value of one ninety nine a month, there's owns unbelievable value for any uh, for any boxing fan. Yeah. I mean, look, and we spoke, didn't we, before? Like my kids are 17 and 19 now, but yeah. throughout entire lockdown and even up to today, you walk in the bedroom or whatever and they've got tellies on the walls and stuff. They're not they're never watching TV. Yeah, so I think I, that's just the way the world's going now. That, and that's where it is. So it's that's where the world's moving now. So for kids under, I think, age uh, a bit younger than me and probably even younger than you, Crawler, now, I think you're past it. I think that's just how they watch, that's just how they consume stuff. They just, they just watch it on that and think it's exciting. One interesting thing I saw this week, and it'll be one I think for us to keep his eye on, or one bit I've heard is that the zone are looking to buy BT. So that could be an interesting development if that happens because it's kind of complete. Isn't it be interesting that? Thanks for that. That's great. And I think it's really interesting that Sky have chosen to stay in boxing. And I, I think that's great. But Jake, as a fan, what, what do you make of all this change? Yeah, like, you know, we need competition. We've seen that as much as we had the Frank Warren and Eddie rivalry, Frank only really had Fury. And the competition wasn't really there with his UK cards versus Eddie's UK cards. That Eddie's cards were just so much better and drew so much more attention. So I think the more people who are involved in boxing, the better. Like, I'm probably one of the very few boxing fans who wants KSI to be involved in boxing in some way. I, I actually like the, the YouTube side of it. I like that Jake Paul's in it because, I don't know, like, I, it's a fight. And at the end of the day, I like watching people fight. And whether it's... If someone what, shouts, fight, fight, yeah. fight over there, you'll be over there like exactly. an audience. No, but, no, no, it's what we do. Yeah, and you shout fight, fight, fight in a school playground and where is everyone in the corner watching exactly. it? You're absolutely right. It's sports entertainment at yeah. the end of the day. I don't, like and I don't the... disagree. I'm a purist in some ways, but I think it's the way forward. Yeah. You cannot ignore the internet evolution, the digital and, and evolution. And people who do, who do ignore it, they're, they're just... It's kind of like with anything in life, nobody likes change. Nobody wants to go to... Nobody wants to download the zone not nobody, but very few people want to because they're so used to having the skybox. But in 10 years, that would just be a normal thing. Exactly. Like We've got the zone on our phone. I'm watching the boxing when I'm at the pub on my phone. And that's just going to be you a normal be raving, part of life. take a break and go and watch it in the middle of the night. On your <laughs> I, I want to be at one of your raves, Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> they went pulling that back quickly to box in <laughs> the one of the weirdest things I think though is that now actually with the smart TVs is that you can cast a zone on your television so actually they've got the linear as well so uh, being here in the Algarve at the moment you know I can't watch Sky here so actually I have to rely on the fights into zone so it just makes it more accessible to me for other, and for other I, as people. a fan I actually I would like to see Eddie have less power in the UK I think it'll be it'll keep him on his toes his cards will be better if he has to compete with other people and I think it's, it's good let, let someone else enter the frame Ben Shalom, I don't know much about him, but he's a young guy. Let's give, give somebody new a well, chance. We need to develop more promoters, you know. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Susanna, you're getting involved with Unified Promotions, which is a brilliant thing as well. And it's, I think the, the, you cannot stop the sport evolving. What I like about the YouTubers getting involved, you know, if you count the, th- the two Paul brothers and KSI together, that's 100 million subscribers, okay, across their digital right. platforms. I love it because I'm not an... I'm, not, I'm an old school boxing guy in a certain way, but I think you have to adopt and change. And I think it's going to bring a new audience to the sport. Yes, it might mean some NFL player is, you know, is going to fight against a former boxer. It doesn't matter. I, I think more people will come to the sport, see the value of the sport. And I, I think the stuck in the muds, they're always going to be there. And I think it's, I'm happy to see the change. 
because at the end of the day, it's a niche sport and the more it can be brought into the mainstream, the better. I, I tend to agree, but let's see what the fans think when Martin now talks to fans fight back. So I'm now getting to the point where when I discuss boxing, I don't bother to research it anymore. I work on the basis of if I remember that it's there, then it's meaningful. And if it's not, then I don't care about it enough to have remembered it. What do you remember from the fight camp announcements? I just feel that the fight cards that they announced were massively underwhelming um, for fight camp. It was They were selling it on the basis that the game was being changed, supposedly. Game, game hasn't been changed at all. You've got the odd decent fight, decent headline fight, but that's about it. I'm expecting a lot more. And inevitably, that 199 will go up. And, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see if they, they continue to deliver money. I think at, at the price, at the price point, uh, we can't really argue. But as it goes up, we will demand um, better cards from top to bottom, really. Yeah. But actually, Bolotniks, that's, uh, that's an intriguing yeah. one. Don't mind that. Yeah. But you're right. There's a... There's a triangle almost of like what you've promised us against what the price point is against what you've delivered. And what you've promised us is huge. What you've delivered is, you know, no better than what you were delivering before, but you're doing it at a cheaper rate. So we'll kind of give you a bit of a, a pass. Um, but, you know, if that price had gone up now and they made a big point of it's only one ninety nine for fight camp, it shouldn't be any more than that because it's, it's pretty, like, on the whole, the fact that we can remember between us about four fights that have been announced kind of sums it up, really. But for one ninety nine a month, I'm all right with that. I, <laughs> I don't really expect any more for that, that price point. Fascinating. And it really, really does intrigue me as to where this goes. And, you know, as they rightly say, DAZN's quite cheap. But was it game-changing? It was a punchy statement to make out there, wasn't it? That they were going to change it and then to put the cards out. Going back to the home of Matchroom in the grounds there. Bit of a repeat performance. What, what do you make of it all, Gareth? Well, I was there last year when Dillian White and Alexander Povetkin fought on a night with no crowd. It was amazing. Um, and it's an amazing setting. It's like a Bond movie. It's like sitting in a Bond movie when the fireworks start and, the, the, you know, the sun goes down. You've got London in the, back, and in the background and the backdrop. Um... The cards aren't the most amazing, but it's all the usual matchroom suspects. But I mean that in a good way. Joshua Boatze is a great fight. Kid Galahad, Jazza Dickens, Tasha Jonas, Ebony Bridges. Um, you know, the cards all... weren't actually that great last year either, but we had amazing fights. So, exactly. You know, Conor always... Ben, you know, yeah. he's, he's rolled out his stable. But I think for me, it's the game change globally is what they're talking about. Game change in the way they're presenting boxing now. I still think game game change was a very big statement and he kind of set himself up for a fall there by saying that, you know, that everyone had their expectations like, well, now he's got all this money, we're going to get amazing cards, every fight's going to be incredible. But actually, he came up with kind of the same things we were getting on Sky. Obviously, I'm happy, 199 and not paying the, mm. the price I had to pay for Sky. So it, we can't complain, but... The, yeah. I guess the one thing I feel is it's that the, the fear for me, and I'm glad why Sky have stayed in it actually, is that when he said it, this, you know, we are boxing now. This isn't gay, this isn't boxing changing. We are boxing, and I think that's quite dangerous. I don't want this to become that kind of cartel where there's no competition, there's no moment. We, we need competition in this, don't we? We need to keep it live. So uh, thanks ever so much indeed. We're going to go for a break now. We'll see you shortly. <laughs> And welcome back to Pitch Boxing. With me is Gareth A. Davis, and we are joined now by Dr. Bernardo. And we're going to talk about doping in boxing. So um, they didn't do any through the pandemic. Apparently, they turned all of the drug testing off. So a little bit controversial. Um, coming to you, do you think it's possible to cheat? Is it is it possible to get away with uh, with taking drugs and not getting caught? Uh, unfortunately, I have to say it's not possible. It's a reality. It's not just boxing, but. Uh you name the sport, okay? Um, doping is part of the high-level sports, 
um, and it will make part of it. Unfortunately, I have to say this, but uh, it's always like a, a game of the cat and the mouse trying to uh, escape the, the, um, the, 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 the controls of the doping. But uh, briefly, yes. yes. It feels it feels like it shouldn't happen, and I know you have quite strong views about when it does happen. What you know, what well, you, you tell me what your view. Well, I mean, it's it's fine for people like Lance Armstrong to cheat, win numerous Tour de France's, but he's not involved in trying to render someone unconscious. Boxing fight sports are inherently dangerous. Um, you can get legally killed in a ring, and the residue from people taking drugs is what gives them extra ability to train and it enhances their body. It's deeply, insidiously, heinously cheating in my view. Um, I think it's not tiddlywinks, it's not a, a tickling competition and I think very severe bans are necessary in the sport. Most clinical sports psychologists will tell you that elite athletes, their brain competitively operates at a different level and if they can get away with it they will and they shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. Is there something where you say and you make a really good point that this is actually it's very physical and people can die in a ring so if you have enhanced yourself are you liable for that? Does I, that I, move you into manslaughter? That, that's the it? issue Susanna that down the line we haven't had it yet but there will come a time I hope it doesn't ever happen that someone will die in a ring and it does happen um, and the testing afterwards will show that that person had taken an anabolic steroid or a steroid that's banned, a steroid that's enhanced their performance in the manslaughter of that person. And I think that's what we'll end up in. We'll end up in court over it. Mm -hmm. Dr Bernardo, do you think we'll ever eradicate this? Do you think we'll ever get rid of drugs in sport? Well, once again, unfortunately, sometimes we need to really go down and something massive happens in order for us to take some 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 measures. It's like the, the infarctions uh, during a football uh, match. Uh, you need to have uh, an infarction and spread uh, in the social media for it to be mandatory to have the defibrillator on the ground. Okay, so uh, I totally agree with that. The, the persons are the, the brains are totally wired in a different way once they are on steroids. And and if there are consequences other than uh, winning a race and killing a guy legally. The, the, the band must be different. It's, sure. I, think, I think it's a very extreme thing to say lifetime bands, but if you brought in, the, the average life of an elite athlete is eight, maximum 10 years. I mean, it's extraordinary when people are in boxing for longer than that at the top level. But if you were to ban people for at least four years, five years, you take away half their career, you look down the top 10 pound for pound in the world right now, and the guy that's at number one has even tested positive. Um, so it's time for the industry, I think, before it gets too bad, before we have an incident like this, to take an extreme measure. It might wipe out a generation of fighters even, the very best, but if you lay down the law, the law is there and you go on from that. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think it's I think it's sad we won't eradicate it, but I think sadly it's um it'll take a big event too, won't it? But we're going to hand out now to Rich, Anthony, and Tasha, who are going to debate exactly this from where they are back in the UK. So and um, here's one. It's becoming a boring subject that we just can't leave alone. Jane Pascal gets done for doping. Not no 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 yes. Wow. Full, almost a full house for four different things. Where's it going now, doping in boxing? It's, it's where are we? Mate, do you know what? It's Unfortunately, it's not going anywhere. And that's like really sad to say about the sport that we love. But um, it's been a problem for a long time now, and it's going to continue to keep being a problem, in my opinion, until harsher sentences are given out, uh, much harsher sentences are given out. It's like now really what, What's Pascal lost, other than the one PD, which would have been nice, I suggest, you know, world title fight, rematch. He was in this amazing sort of Indian summer, and, you know, his career, finding form of his career after all, after looking shot to pieces years earlier. And then it's like, well, I've been caught now and I was coming to the end. So what, what's he lost? But I think we've said it before, and I think the way to stop it, I think lifetime bands have got to start to be handed out or like massive fines massive fines not six month bans or 12 month bans and they start from the date your last fight so really they're hardly out the ring I just think 
the only way to stop it is one either lifetime bans or hit them financially. Because otherwise it's going to just continue to keep happening. And there'll always be people who will take chances and there's people who are getting away with it, as as we know. Um, but I think the only way to stop it is those kind of punishments. Tash, you're not officially a member of me and Ant's anti-doping crew yet, but I'm printing you a T-shirt as we speak, so you're joining, you're in it. What is Listen. the anti If you were in charge, Tash, for 24 hours and they said, how do you fix anti-doping in boxing or what should the... What should the punishments be? What would you do? Well, the first thing is for WADA not to announce that they're not going to be testing during COVID because that was the biggest... <laughs> We've had this, we? why, why would you do that? You're great. Why would you tell the whole... Announce to the whole world on, on every type of platform, right, we're not testing anymore because that's given anyone who wasn't a drug cheat and anyone who was thinking about drug cheating and anyone just the opportunity to be able to do it and possibly get away with it anyway. Um, so I wouldn't be doing that. And, and 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 promoters can do their part. And if someone gets tested and, and they're found, you know, whatever, then don't put them on shows. That stops it yeah. as well. So if you're if the if the governing bodies and the sanctioning bodies and whatever aren't going to do nothing, okay, promoters just don't put them on. And in terms of punishment? I, I agree with that. Longer sentences, lifetime bans, especially, you know, we're in a dangerous sport where people can get seriously hurt and die. And what happens then? Does it does, is it going to take for that to happen before we do start introducing bigger penalties? Thanks, guys. And on a slightly less controversial topic now, I'm delighted to introduce Spencer Oliver, former European champion, and Paul Ince, former England player, who are going to talk about their top five greatest all-time boxers. So we're going to talk about the five greatest fighters of all time. I brought in my mate old Incy there, Nigel Ben's cousin. Don't worry about that, he knows he's boxing. And we're going to go five greatest fighters of all time. Number one. It's got to be Muhammad Ali, isn't it? I'm going Sugar Ray Robinson. On what grounds? What, look, beyond his years, great. Yeah, hang right. on, listen, listen. Yeah. I, th I think when you talk no, about... Ali's number two for me. No, Ali can't be number two. What? You know, that's, no, he can't be, because when you talk about the greatest, that's why it's called the greatest, the greatest Ali. You know what I mean? They don't say the greatest Sugar Ray Robinson, do they? <laughs> no, but I'm just fucking... <laughs> so I'm I, going technical. Yeah, but I think Ali's got to be the best. All right. You know, you think what he's done, you know what I mean? Yeah. Titles right. that he's won, I'm you going, know what I mean? Uh, the times I'm going English. Sugar Ray Robinson, you've gone Ali. Number yeah. two. Um, Sugar Ray uh, Leonard. I'm going Ali. Ali's number two. <laughs> Ali's number two? Yeah, why not? Okay, cool. Yeah. Listen. Number three. You know what? I know you like Marvin Hagler. I know he's a, he's a, big, yeah. he's a big one for you, yeah. really, Marvin Hagler. You know, I'd, I was fortunate to meet Marvin Hagler mm. in, in the Milan, actually, watching, we were going to the theatre yeah. to watch Anita Baker in concert. Yeah, yeah. Nice. And he was there because he was living in Milan. Right. Um, and that's the first time I met him. Uh, what a man. He is. What a man. Incredible he, he, man. Even, he's just fighting you now, just when he looked yeah. at him, you know what I mean, yeah, when yeah. he retired. Uh, this was back in 95, 96 this was. Uh, and he was some fighter, you know, the fights mm. with Joe Duran, Hands of Stones yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah. Ray Leonard. They were massive. Tommy yeah. Hearns, the hitman, you know, all those top, top fighters, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's hard to pick one, isn't it? You know what I mean? But I, so I won't be too adverse if you feel Hagler in at number three. Um, number three, Marvin Hagler. We both agree on that one, don't we? Yeah. Okay, cool. Number four. This might surprise a few people, but you've got to find Floyd Waymaker. You know, shout. when you're 50, 50 and 0. Good shout. You know, come on, listen, there's been some... Good you know, shout. It, he's got to be there, hasn't he? If you talk Good about talent boxers, you know, Absolutely. what he's Mayweather's done and the people that he's fought. You can't, you can't argue it. No, people forget he, he you know... So you're, going, you're going Mayweather? Well, we talked about Canelo being probably one of the best pound pound fighters. Mayweather beat him. Of a modern era, yeah. Yeah, yeah Mayweather yeah. beat him. They dealt with him, you know what I mean? So, so you got May Mayweather number four? Yeah, what are you going? I'm going Sugar Ray Leonard number four. Okay. Number five. I'll let you go number five, so I'm still I'll thinking about Mayweather. number five. You got Mayweather number yeah. five? Yeah, I've got to stick him in there. Um, number five. It's a tough one, isn't it? Number five. Yeah. There's been so many top top yeah, that, boxers. That, that's, that, that's the thing. That's it, the thing. It's always going to be a debate. Um, I don't know. You know, I really don't know. Number five. Stick your cousin in there. Nige. I could stick Nige in now. <laughs> um, he'll have the ump if you don't. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be Nige, isn't it? It's got to be, got to be the Dark Destroyer. There Watch you it go. As, there what am I thinking about? Yeah. Dark Destroyer. There you go. But there's some of the top ones in there, and ones there who are going to be great yeah. you know, in the future. Listen, you know. There's a debate for loads more brilliant Ooh. fighters, but that's mine and Paul Ince's top five fighters of all time.
And you've got to love the chemistry between those two. They are amazing. So, Gareth, your top five, can you? Well, Paul Ince, clearly. Obviously. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, that guy looks like he'd fight. And the fact he's the cousin of Nigel Benn is extraordinary. My top five, um, it's not far off theirs. I'm going to pick three because it's too long a debate otherwise. I think uh, Sugar Ray Robinson is the greatest boxer of all time. Extraordinary in three weight divisions, way ahead of his time. Muhammad Ali, for me, is the guy that's had the most impact on society in the sport. And I think from my era that I've covered, because I think it's your era, the people you are around and witness live, I've got to pick Floyd Mayweather. He was pretty boy early in his career, aggressive. Um, he became a masterful genius defensively. And he took it all the way to 50, you know, amazing. It Absolutely is amazing. amazing. I, I particularly like watching Mike Tyson. I thought he was just an amazing fighter. Um, Frank Bruno from the Comedy Valley with the laugh is great. Um, I thought Eubank in the ring was sensational as well. Um, but I've got to say as well, you know, there's some great up and coming fighters now, aren't there? So it'd be interesting to see what Ben Jr. can do. So uh, thanks ever so much. We'll be back. Hello and welcome back. I am delighted to be joined by Gareth A. Davis, who we're going to talk women's boxing now, aren't we? Which is something I am truly passionate about. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to let you quiz me a little bit. or we'll, we'll have a discussion, shall we? We'll have a discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, no, it's a fascinating developing area of the sport. Um, I know you've had your eye on it a long time. It's why you've become a boxing promoter and that you're pushing hard for women's boxing and bringing in a lot of measures that perhaps aren't there for them. And I... I mean, my first kind of experience, if you like, of very big women's boxing was covering Muhammad Ali's daughter, Layla Ali, back 20 odd years ago, um, and seeing the impact that had. I, I watched um, Joe Frazier's daughter, Jackie Frazier Lied, and Muhammad Ali's daughter, Amazing. Uh, Layla Ali, have Ali Frazier 4, as they called it, in a circus tent in Syracuse in, in New York State many years ago. And it was amazing, and loads of boxing stars were there. And it made me realize that day that um, there is massive scope if women have the right style, if they, they box the right way, if they have the pull and the narrative, it can be an amazing event. But it was a one-off thing. In 2012, and you will have seen it, and I'm sure it had an influence on you, women's boxing came into the Olympics for the first time, and we saw amazing women box. We saw Nicola Adams win, Absolutely. we saw um, Clarissa Shields win, and we saw Katie Taylor win. They were the only three champions. Did that Olympics have an impression on you seeing women's boxing in the mainstream for the first time and the fact that people were responding to it in an amazing way? Completely. And I, I think it's one of those changes that it still blows my mind that 2012 was the first time that boxing was in the Olympics for women. You know, that still seems less than a decade ago. It still seems that it's, you know, it should have been beforehand. But I think what's been so interesting in there is following the careers of those women that have done so well. You know, Tash Jonas and, you know, that, that, that fight that we've just seen again since the first time, four, ten years since they met there was mm. amazing, absolutely amazing. And what an incredible fight that was and I think if anything good's come out of the pandemic it's the fact that women's boxing has really escalated we always knew it was good but there was always the argument that it didn't sell tickets and therefore it didn't get on the shows but actually where we didn't have tickets to sell and it was behind closed doors some of these fights got to be shown and actually they are good fights they are you know they're, they're driven there is focus there and it's it's one of those strange anomalies. I think sometimes when you look at the difference in the way people play tennis or they play football, actually the sexes are quite different. But when it comes to boxing, although the rounds are of a shorter time, it is as it is as hard, it is as tough, and it is as exhilarating to watch. So um, I'm delighted they've had the opportunity, and I'm delighted we've seen some of the most incredible fights that we have in, in the last year. I do agree with you. I mean, I was there at the... Um Katie Taylor and Tasha Jonas fight for the, you know, the, the undisputed lightweight title. And it's that weird thing. It was 10 two-minute rounds, but I could have seen more. I would love to see a trilogy fight. It was a back and forth seesaw contest. Yeah. No quarter given by either woman. You know, the whole array of punches. And it was an, I think it's the best live women's fight I've ever seen. I agree, and I, I'd and, love and, to see a trilogy. But, I'd love but to but see But what it also again, showed, yeah. Susanna, is in that intervening nine years, how much the two women had come on technically. And that amateur boxing is amateur boxing. Yeah, it's Olympic, it's Commonwealth, and it's got its own, um, you know, world championships. 
professional boxing is a business. You need bums on seats. You need television deals. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think you're coming into it yourself as a promoter in the right time that there is definitely a peak in interest now in women's boxing as sports entertainment. Yeah. But I just wonder, can we develop it more? Are you looking to do three-minute rounds? Are you uh, 12, 12 round fights? Are you looking to shift the paradigm, if you like, um, and, and have tournaments with women in. What, what are you looking to do to bring that into sports entertainment? I think, I think all of that, but I think most importantly before all of that is actually making sure that people get fairly looked after and fairly paid and fairly sponsored. And I think that, women's, you say, women's boxing is up and coming, it's amazing, but it's still almost the forgotten undercard. And I think there's a whole load of issues that need to be addressed in women with sport. And this isn't just about protecting, you know, this is all just about the girls and keeping them safe, etc. But actually there are so many young women now that are joining um, that are coming out boxing and that's fantastic because it's a proper proper you know it's a, it's a proper sport now it's, it's a profession but actually down you know to a much lower level people still have to work you know that we have full-time jobs and you know I know, I know lots of um, mailboxes have to work as well but in a lower level you know right up to professional women are still having to do full-time jobs be mums juggle it all but I but think it needs enhancing doesn't it and it needs that, that umbrella of safeguarding you talk about and it needs enhancing absolutely. quickly to create a, a career absolutely, for these women absolutely. Yeah. and you know what it makes a really good point I'm going to hand out to Tasha Jonas who actually did an amazing campaign recently about no means no Tasha over to you so Tash I saw your face pop up on uh, all sky socials this week uh, a new campaign they started for you know for women and for girls taking up boxing no means no what how did that come about and what does it mean to you I think it's come about um just at the right time you know there's a lot of issues that women are going through at the moment and there's you know big news stories at the minute with you know um the effects that it's having on women and basically just no meaning no and, and people not being able to accept that um you know mentally physically emotionally we all know about the positives of boxing um but there's a there's a certain type of empowerment that you get and a confidence knowing that you can protect yourself there's not there's not we're not saying that every woman you know should go and try and fight men or whatever, but there is a confidence and, and that you get from from being able to protect yourself, and I think that's really important for women and young young girls to be able to do do that. Yeah, from a self defence point of view, and it's it's fantastic in it to see young girls taking up boxing and learning how to defend themselves. Because look, you know, lots of self defence systems rely on certain situations where in boxing sometimes a good whack on those tash to a fella is. Is the quickest route from it to be in it? I was going to say it's the quickest way, quickest way, and a lot of the times the most successful way. Yeah, so no, it's it's great to see Sky taking it up, and uh, and you've a part of it, Tasha, and uh, good luck with that going forward. Cheers, thank you. Thank you, Tasha. You're amazing. And I think picking up from that, one of the things I think is so important as well is the equipment that's available to women in boxing. I think, you know, the, the, the whole moment of ergonomically designed gloves that actually fit women's hands, the importance of having boots that are actually made for women's feet and not just not just the great phrase that we heard here this week that was make it smaller and pink, so pink it and shrink it, which I, I love and I think is just so wrong. But I think there's a wider piece now that needs to be spoken about as well with, you know, British Border Boxing Control that actually belts shouldn't finish um, to protect crown jewels but lie straight across the women's ovaries because it's more dangerous there than not and I think that you know that whole safeguarding pieces we've talked about is is about having the right equipment is, is would you agree no totally I mean I think that's that's the kind of thing that you're going to bring in differently because you're seeing it from a different perspective you're seeing it as you know someone who's incredibly successful in what they do and they're you're bringing your perspicacity into the sport and saying no there's a gap there that needs doing that needs moving that needs shifting like you say equipment incredibly important important protective equipment incredibly important one of the things that I'd also like to see and I don't know whether you want to get involved in this as well is is more medical research into women's boxing so um, you know should they have longer than two minute rounds is it really old research where's where does that I think it dates back to 2013 that research yeah, doesn't it yeah. it's that it's time to bring things up to date you know people are changing physically all the time so 
Um, I just wonder whether you're going to get into that nitty gritty medically as well. Completely, completely. And actually, interestingly, as much as I love the, um, you know, the idea of it being longer rounds, I quite like how, you know, it's very punchy, it's very quick. And I think the longer rounds might take away from there. But I think that should be based on research 100%. I think it should be factual. Um, you know, and, and as you say, since 2013, which is almost as long as women's boxing has been going now, and we've changed enormously, medical attention's changed. But I, I think we should look at, you know, is there a physicality? Also, there's levels of dehydration. Women dehydrate far, far quicker than men do. Mm. So actually, are those two-minute rounds because they need to stay hydrated? Um, you know, the whole weight brackets. I think there's a whole lot of stuff that needs looking at. But my goal and my goal at Unified Promotions, I think, is to put enough eyeballs on just women. Not to be part of a stable where it kind of gets forgotten, but actually to have it holistically looking at as one big conglomerate to get really good sponsorship, really good funding, really good research behind it, really good equipment. And that's really what Unified stands for. It's about giving, giving women... A unified approach into boxing and all of those guys coming up you know from from the next generation um, to have somewhere to go to understand you know understand what it's about as a career yeah and obviously none of that's ever been done before and I applaud you on that it's a brilliant advancement in the sport another new thing that's happening that was announced just this week was that um, the World Boxing Super Series are going to do a women's tournament for the first time and, and the World Boxing Super Series of course um, made stars out of Noya Inui, the brilliant young Japanese fighter, uh, Alexander Usyk, Maris Bredis, Callum Smith, Josh Taylor, Absolutely. they're all big names in the sport now and the fact that the WB, uh, the World Boxing Super Series, have chosen to do a women's super featherweight tournament brings Terry Harper, the British world champion, into it. Michaela Mayer, who won in a top-ranked card in Las Vegas last weekend. I know that tournament, women's tournament boxing, I don't know what you think of that, first of all, um, but, but also um, I know that you have potentially thoughts on doing tournaments for women as well absolutely i mean phone back to i think it's fantastic i think the more that you know more people get behind this the more we're going to get to a head of steam and the more eyeballs mm. we put mm. on it the bigger mm. it comes so mm. i you know i think i've never been i always say all the time is it's not my slice of the pie it's how do we make the pie bigger so everyone gets a bigger slice so i applaud anyone who wants to step into this space and i'm looking forward to working with them um but i think yeah i think tournaments is a great way of doing things i think it's going to be really interesting um and i'm i'm you know we can probably learn from them we're going to kick off in about october which is really exciting um, so I think we can start, you know, start all working together to uh, to look at how this pans out. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. Um, I think there's lots to play for, or lots to fight for, should I say. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thrilled to be involved. And as you say, having not having a boxing background, but being able to come in maybe with a fresh pair of eyes, I'm excited possibly to challenge some things and possibly to look at things a little bit differently. But uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting time ahead. But Gareth, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure to the <laughs> have to look at the camera and say peace out it's been a pleasure doing the show with you in the sunny algarve it's amazing thanks so much for tuning in it's been absolutely fantastic to do the show here with gareth and i'm going to give you the final word sir please sign us out peace out